Good morning. Let's ask God for help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your living word. Please help us by your spirit to listen to it and to learn from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Vivian and I are both working from home, as so many of us are just now. And the other day we met at coffee time in the kitchen, which is always a highlight. And I said to Vivian, I am really struggling with this sermon. And she asked, what's it about? And I said, it's about not losing heart. And she laughed. She's always uh, sympathetic in that kind of way. And she said, so you are preaching to yourself. Yes, I replied. We've come this morning in our series on the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians to chapter 4 verses 7 to 18. And if you've got a Bible to hand, please open that up. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 to 18. And I've called this hardship that brings a harvest. This is a passage of scripture that uh, at all times means a great deal to me and especially at the moment when uh, we seem to be almost engulfed by reasons that could easily tempt us to lose heart. That's true for all of us who are trying to get on with our Christian service and ministry in the midst of this pandemic and the restrictions that come with it. And of course, I'm not just talking about those of us wearing clerical collars, but all of us involved in service in the name of Jesus, both inside and beyond the life of the church. As it happens, I heard my son Ben preach on this passage a few months ago, and I've kept my notes by me ever since. His title was Don't Lose Heart, so I couldn't use that. John Teasdale took us through chapter 4 verses 1 to 6 last week, which are all of a piece with this passage. So this is really part two. Chapter 4 begins, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And then Paul hammers that home again in verse 16 towards the end of our passage where he says, so we do not lose heart. One of the reasons I was struggling with this is that the teaching of the Bible is so rich and subtle and multi-layered and deep that it seems impossible to do it justice. And so it is. So I've resorted again to three super simple headings and I hope these will help us to suck as much as we can out of this in a short time. So first, the Apostle Paul is afflicted. He's hopeful too and we'll come to that, but first we need to give proper weight to the suffering that he's gone through and is still going through as he writes this. And he wants us to know about his suffering because through this letter he repeatedly and graphically pictures it. Why? He's not wanting pity, quite the reverse. He wants us to learn hope through Jesus in our afflictions as he has. So he says back in chapter 1 verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced. And then take a look at our passage, chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. He says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. We mustn't let his hopefulness blind us to the depth of these afflictions that he describes. He says he's afflicted, crushed, perplexed, struck down. And later in the letter, he further fills out what he's been through. So, for instance, in chapter 6, verses 4 to 5, he tells of afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors sleepless nights, hunger. And as he writes this letter, it's made all the worse by the fact that he's been separated, alienated from these Corinthian Christians, not just by distance and geography, but relationally, despite the fact that they came to faith in Christ through his self-sacrificial 
preaching. There are some who are trying to persuade them to reject him. So it could hardly be worse for the apostle. His afflictions are severe and sustained. And we mustn't lose sight of the fact that they were all brought on him as a result of his ministry. How amazing it is that he says uh, of this ministry that he has it by the mercy of God in chapter 4 verse 1. All he had to do was to stop preaching Christ and then he could have just retired in peace and gone back home to Tarsus. But he couldn't stop. Chapter 4 verse 13, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, and here he quotes Psalm 116, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. What he knows to be true about Jesus in his mind and in his heart inevitably pours out of his mouth. He cannot stop. So the afflictions follow. No wonder he describes himself in chapter 4 verse 7 as like a jar of clay. He says there, but we have this treasure, the gospel that is, in jars of clay. He is a fragile, disposable, commonplace container. One of those despised plastic carrier bags, if you like, in his terms a clay jar. And if once the gospel has been handed on, he ends up getting smashed to pieces and thrown in the bin, that's okay with him. And in the end, of course, that is effectively what happened to him as he was executed by the Roman sword. Such are his afflictions that he even dares to liken them to the physical sufferings of Jesus. So in verse 10, he uses this striking phrase about himself, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, like a kind of slow motion, lifelong crucifixion. So the Apostle Paul is afflicted. And in some way, if we try to serve Jesus faithfully and show him to the world, we too will be afflicted. One of the things that I find very moving about the fact that now I've been around JPC for some decades is that I have seen some of the afflictions that some of you have been through and indeed are going through now. I know that many of your afflictions are hidden, few if any are aware of them, but some of them you cannot hide. And Paul wouldn't be surprised, but he does want us to find comfort in our afflictions. How then do we find that comfort? Well, by learning hope from the afflicted apostle. So to my next heading. First, the apostle Paul is afflicted. And then secondly, the apostle Paul has hope. Why does he have hope in such dire circumstances? Well, here are six reasons. One, he knows that he has treasure filling his afflicted life. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. What is this treasure? Back up to verse 6. The treasure is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He knows Jesus, who was afflicted, killed, raised from the dead, who ascended to heaven and poured out his Holy Spirit. Jesus is his treasure. Two, he knows that God has a purpose in his afflictions. Verse 7 again, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It was one of Paul's great life lessons that our fragility and suffering, far from being a problem, is in fact an asset if what we want is for other people to see Jesus in us and to come to know him through us. It's a tough but crucial lesson for the disciple of Jesus. Paul returns to it later on in the letter when he famously describes how God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He has learned that his transparent fragility 
lets the light of Christ shine through so that people can see Jesus and not get misled into thinking that he is the one that they should be following. Three, he knows that in the end, nothing can destroy him. However fiercely burn his fiery trials, there is never any place at all for despair in Paul's makeup because he knows that he is safe with Jesus. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Four, he knows that his affliction is for the sake of Jesus. Verses 10 and 11, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And it is the glory of Jesus that is his supreme concern and not his own comfort. Five, he knows that his affliction is also for the sake of those Corinthian Christians and beyond them indeed it is for our sake. Verse 12, so death is at work in us but life in you. And again in verse 15, it is for, it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so we do not lose heart. And six, he knows that present temporary afflictions are far outweighed by future eternal glory. Given the scale of his sufferings, what he says here in verses 16 to 18 is perhaps one of the most staggering statements of faith in the whole Bible. He says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Light momentary affliction. Now, of course, when he says that, he's not making light of his sufferings, not at all. It's just that however bad they are, he knows that they will be overwhelmed by the blazing eternal glory to come. If I might jump from the sublime to the ridiculous, here is an illustration. The other day, Vivian and I went blackberrying together. We have a favorite and fruitful spot, and no, I'm not going to tell you where it is. And we spent maybe two hours or so getting scratched by thorns and stung by stinging nettles as we reached into the hedgerows over and over again. Why did we not lose heart and give up? Because we could see the growing pile of delicious juicy fruit. And I for one was thinking of all that blackberry jam and all those blackberry and apple pies that we would be able to enjoy throughout the year. Our hardship, such as it was, brought a harvest. On a rather different scale, the Apostle Paul did not lose heart because he had such a powerful hope. Finally then, and thirdly, let's learn from the Apostle. Let's listen to him. Listen, because he is an authentic servant and apostle of Jesus. His afflictions testify to that. Listen, because what he teaches is a treasure beyond price. Listen, because his afflictions put ours into perspective. 
Whatever we go through in our lives and in our service of Jesus, few, if any of us, get anywhere near what he went through. And let's learn from him too. Learn that our afflicted faith is a blessing to others. They draw strength and help and hope from us. Learn that our afflictions bring us closer to Jesus. That is the experience that the Holy Spirit gives as we meet affliction with faith. Even dare that in the perspective of, of eternity, our afflictions, uh, even dare to learn that in the perspective of eternity, our afflictions are light and momentary as we keep our eyes on future glory. And learn never to lose heart in the service of Jesus. The temptations to do so are so very great. There is hardship before the harvest, but the harvest will surely come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the power of your grace at work by your Spirit in the life of your servant Paul. Help us, we pray, whatever afflictions we face, now or in the years to come, to learn from him. And teach us to, we pray, never to lose heart. In Jesus' name, Amen.